Hey, so hi, my name is Sebastian Budden. I'm a founding member of Historical Materialism Journal and the book series and the conferences, some of which you would already be familiar with. So I want to just to pitch to you the idea of you uh, subscribing to the journal, firstly. The journal comes out four times a year, published by Brill, over a thousand pages of uh, extremely important and stimulating uh, Marxist theory. And Marxist history. Um, we have a discount at the moment for individual subscribers around the time of the, the London conference, and we very strongly uh, both request and uh, demand that you subscribe to the journal, that you uh, get other people to subscribe to the journal, and of course that you get uh, your institution, if you're part of a university or other institution, to subscribe to the journal. We need more subscribers for this project to be able to expand and continue. The second thing I really wanted to push was the book series. Uh, the book series you will also probably be familiar with. It's published by Real Academic Press and then the volumes come out 12 months later with Haymarket Books in Chicago, paperback. Um, we have more than 200 volumes published now, of translations of original work, of document collections, of uh, translations from uh, Marxist theory from across the world, from Japan to uh, uh, China, to um, India, to Latin America, very important Latin American list shaping up in the book series and so on. Um, it's a really crucial intervention in Marxist uh, literature and uh, in making Marxist theory available um, that really hasn't existed on this scale since the 1970s. So we'd like you to look at the book series, buy individual volumes, perhaps take up the author of the book club that Haymarket is, uh, is, is uh, promoting. And also, of course, if, again, if you're part of an institution, to get your institution to buy as many volumes as possible. Uh, those are the two key elements of our activity, aside from the conferences, the journal and the book series. And we think it would be uh, well, we think it's essential, basically, for us, for our existence, for us to be able to continue to thrive for those to expand. So please, subscribe to the journal, buy the books in the book series, publicize both around you, and help us build the historical materialism project. Thanks. So, uh, welcome, uh, welcome everyone uh, for this uh, session today on Marxism and in India. I hope uh, people can hear me. I am Saroj Giri. I am uh, connecting to this session from Delhi. Uh, I hope uh, I can't really tell, but I hope there are people who have joined and people who can uh, hear me. Um, uh, uh, am I audible, Craig? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so um, so we have uh, the session is called Marxism in India, and I think uh, um, it is always a relevant uh, uh, relevant connection to make between Marxism and India, considering Marxism has a very long history uh, in India. In fact, uh, going back even before the Soviet Revolution, uh, researchers tell us that the earliest uh, translations of Marxist writings. Uh, in India came already in around 1780 or something, you know, uh, sorry, 1880. Uh, you know, the, in fact, uh, a, a, a leader who was regarded as kind of uh, leaning towards the Hindu right. I mean, that's uh, the kind of one kind of perception. <laughs> um, uh, Bal Ganga Dartilak, he used to edit a journal uh, in Marathi. And that's where apparently the first uh, reference to the works of Karl Marx <laughs> appear in uh, India, you know, so that's like 1880. So there's a very long association um, India has with Marxism, not to speak about then what happens after the Soviet revolution and the larger geopolitical thing and the setting up of the Communist Party in India uh, in the 20s and then the workers movement and all of that. 
so there's a immediate kind of a you know connect there uh, between uh, marxism and in india and also considering today's uh, scenario that we see uh, the world over uh, that connection and also the kind of scenario we have in india political situation economic situation and also the churning within radical theory you know in india um, um earlier one would say the question of uh, gender or uh, the environment and all which was regarded as some kind of a challenge to a kind of a traditional thinking on you know marxism but now also the question of caste right how do you really address the uh, question of caste and given the kind of papers we are going to hear today i should also add one more thing also given india's tremendous uh, long continuous history going back to antiquity you know going back to the vedic period uh, a moment earlier we were talking about raul sankrita and you know a very uh, one kind of a marxist who would also invoke india's uh, you know buddhist uh, tradition and in fact some uh, marxist scholars in india used to just as you have uh, you know in marx uh, references to primitive communism in the indian context there's a reference to vedic communism right so these are also this tremendously long and deep and uh, history of antiquity you know which also comes you know uh, to kind of uh, in a kind of a strange convergence you know collapsing historical time scales so even the history of antiquity is something which uh, can come into uh, a discussion of uh, marxism in india and there there is buddhism there is the vedic tradition you know all kinds of other not just charvaka and uh, the more what should i say materialist traditions but even the idealist traditions where there is a lot of uh, very rich material there so there is a very huge uh, area we are looking at so it's a very a timely thing uh, to talk about as far as i am concerned um, you know uh, marxism in india is is in that sense very very uh, timely so to so we have two speakers today uh, on this uh, i'm going to introduce them um, we have uh, dr paromita chakravarti uh, she is associate professor department of english Hasaram Rijumal College, uh, University of Mumbai, Bombay University. Uh, she's uh, published uh, from Brill, uh, a book on uh, connected to Bangladesh, uh, the nineteen seventy one War of Liberation. It's called Women's Bodies, Men's War on nineteen seventy one War of Liberation, Bangladesh. So we are going to speak. Uh, we are going to listen to her. and she's going to uh, her paper her presentation today is on the ongoing farmers movement and women's participation in the ongoing uh, farmers movement uh, and then we have craig uh, brandis he's professor of cultural theory and intellectual history he's uh, the author of the dimensions of hegemony the dimensions of hegemony this is uh, in the historical materialism series uh, he's a professor in university of sheffield in the united kingdom so we have two speakers and uh, uh, yeah and and craig is going to speak on the tradition of um, soviet indology uh, so that's what he's going to and he has worked on it um, uh, he's already published in this field so we have two speakers two presentations and i am told that by the organizers that we give them 20 minutes each uh, but uh, so 20 minutes might not be in itself not adequate uh, but we'll have a good time i believe for the question answer session so i would uh, request um, you know the audience uh, uh, the listeners to stick around for the question answer so if you have questions and comments and if you want to hear from the speaker more i think we'll have some uh, you know comfortable <laughs> time uh, in the question answer session so uh, we will um, now invite uh, the two speakers should we invite uh, craig uh, brandis first craig please go ahead okay thank you very much uh, so uh, 
The issue of caste has long dogged the communist movement in India almost from its inception. It wasn't, an, it wasn't helped by the preponderance of Brahmins in the leadership of the Communist Party throughout its existence and the adoption of the rigid, stadial, Stalinist conception of historical change known by the term Pyatichlinka in Russian, according to, according to which all societies pass through stages of primitive communism, slave owning societies, feudalism, capitalism and socialism. This was actually poorly attuned to the history of India and tended to present caste as a feudal survival destined to fade away with the coming of capitalism. But when that failed to happen, it was treated as a superstructural phenomenon largely, a cultural survival rather than having both economic and cultural ideological dimensions. Correspondingly, there was no systematic engagement with the anti-caste thinkers in the USSR until the late perestroika period. And until 1991, the caste of Indian party members was not even recorded. A highly sectarian attitude towards the anti-caste movement was common. And only recently has a more constructive dialogue uh, between Indian Marxists and Dalit thinkers been re-established. But if we look at the beginning of Soviet Indology, the study of the history and cultures, languages and literatures of the Indian subcontinent, we see more sophisticated thinking among, than among the ideologists of the time. By the time of the revolution, a significant form of Russian Leningrad Indology centered on the work of Sergei Oldenburg and Fyodor Shobatskoy, who published a considerable number of works in English as well, under the name of Theodor Stabatsky, had developed centered not as elsewhere in Europe on Vedic myths and tradition as foundational for both European cultures, but on so-called Mahayana Buddhism as a philosophical tradition that rivaled the achievements of ancient Greek philosophy. While progressive in many respects, the focus was on Sanskritized Buddhism, which had to a considerable extent yielded to the do uh, dominance of Brahminism rather than the more anti-caste perspectives articulated in the various Prakrits or modern languages of India. Thus, in a 1919 essay on Indian literature, Sergei Oldenburg noted, Sanskrit literature is the basis and essence of all Indian literature and that modern Indian literatures provide, and I quote, but pale glimpses of the beauty of ancient India. The focus began to shift in the 1920s, especially in the work of Mikhail Tobiansky and Alexei Baranikov, who worked uh, and int int who introduced the teaching of modern Bengali, Marathi and Hindi at the Institute of Living Oriental Languages in Leningrad. Today I'm going to discuss Baranikov, who pursued pathbreaking work on ch the changes in the Russian language after the revolution and then the languages and ethnology of Roma communities in the USSR. He traced the origin of Soviet Roma in the untouchables of ancient India, considered how their uh, languages and cultures had been affected by centuries of oppression in the diaspora, and worked to codify a, a written Soviet Roma language, the first indeed written uh, Roma language at all. Uh, when the Stalin regime moved to close down gypsy studies in the second half of the 1930s, and just as many older Indologists were caught up in the Great Purge, Baranikov emerged at the lead, as the leading advocate of modern Indian philology in the USSR, establishing the modern Indian office at the Oriental Institute in Leningrad. For all of its limitations, marked by the Stalin period, of course, uh, Baranikov's work is worth a new look today among other reasons, because it offers a more sophisticated understanding of the relationship between colonial and indigenous intellectuals in the emergence of Indology that one finds in many Foucault-inspired forms of post-colonial studies. And it anticipates some of the latest trends emerging in so-called Dalit studies today. There are historical reasons for this, which I'll hardly touch on today, but one important factor was the visit of anti-caste intellectuals such as Raul Sinkretyayan, who has already been mentioned, of course, and Dharmanand Kasambi, uh, the uh, father of the renowned Marxist historian D.D. Kasambi, to Leningrad in the late 1930s and early 19, uh, late 1920s and early 1930s. 
as well as developing the study and teaching of modern Indian languages, Baranikov also developed some important work on modern Indian literature, particularly focused on the Awadi dialect work of the Vaishnava poet Tulsidas, a uh, no, 16th century poet, and on the writer most commonly regarded as the author of the first uh, work in modern literary Hindi, Lalu Lal. Um, now, Baranikov argued that the neglect of these works in, in Indology previously uh, resulted from the connection of Indian, of ancient Indian language and medieval Sanskrit with comparative linguistics, meaning Indo-European philology. The British government's support for research in those areas and the absence of such support for research in the field of modern Indian philology. Also, because of traditional Brahmin hostility towards heretical literature in uh, modern languages, and most importantly, India's colonial position, for it was only with the rise of the national liberation movement that it raised the profile of such works. Baranikov argued that uh, Indo-European philology was not simply an ideology imposed onto the Orient by an imperial power, but that it had arisen when colonial philologists adopted paradigms that had already been developed by Brahmins in pre-colonial India. Pandits schooled in uh, linguistic works of grammarians such as Panini uh, presented Sanskrit as the original literary language of India and Middle Indic or Prakrits and modern Indian languages as but tainted dialects of that standard. The grammarians had in fact codified a scholastic version of Sanskrit in an effort to combat the challenge to Brahminical authority by Buddhists and Vishnavites who were writing in the vernacular. Buddhism and other non-Brahminical creeds um, indigenous to India that made use of Prakrit were regarded as tainted dialects of what became known as Hinduism. While in full contradiction with the historical facts, as he put it, European philologists accepted this narrative and reinforced it with racist conclusions from their own Indo-European theory. According to this theory, the British, being Aryan, Western Aryans, had ended Mughal rule and in so doing had restored historical justice. Until the creative part of the population of India, i.e. Aryan Brahmins, could recover from the Mughal yoke, the British had a responsibility to manage India which it did supposedly according to its ancient traditions. And these traditions were allegedly embodied in Brahminical texts such as the Laws of Manu, which guided by pandits, uh, philologists translated into European languages. Turning to literature, Baranikov focused on the connections between the rise of it, literature in the vernacular and the so-called Bhakti movement, which reached its zenith in Northern India in the 15th to 17th centuries. Central to this were the multiple legends concerning Rama and Krishna as, as um, avatars of Vishnu. Insisting on an individual path to spirituality regardless of birth, status or gender, the Bhakti movement found expression in the work of a number of poet saints who adopted a variety of philosophies and critical perspectives on Brahminism. The most ardently anti-Brahminical were the Hindi poet Kabir, who, folk, who also inspired the founder of Sikhism, Guru Nanak, and the Marathi poet Tukaram, both of whom suffered persecution for their work. But rather than the work of these caste-focused figures, it was the Ram Charitmanas, or the Lake of the Deeds of Ram, that Tuls Tulsidas' retelling of the Sanskrit Ramayana of Valmiki, that Baranikov regarded as the greatest work of literature in the, of the Middle Ages, and this greatness lay in Tulsidas's ability to anticipate one of the key features of socialist realism, which was by the mid 1930s being focused on as the criterion of progressive literature, a commitment to accessibility and to focus on the people, what was in Russian known as Narodnost. Here we can see the Stalinist narrative of national liberation, the national, the leadership of which falls to the progressive elite. India's striving for unity, as Branikov put it, is projected back into the Mughal period, while the progressive role of Brahmins oriented on the Narod, as opposed to those obsessed with their clerical trappings and feudal status, is emphasized. Similarly, Tulsidas's superiority to the militant anti-Brahminism of Kabir and Tukaram 
resides in his recognition of Brahminical hegemony in the liberation struggle. But more interesting than these evident accommodations to the rigid stadialism of Stalinist historiography is the way in which this is correlated with semantic paleontology, as it was called at the time. In accordance with the ideas developed by the controversial Georgian philologist Nikolai Marr in Soviet folklore and literary studies, Baranikov presents the legend of Ram as a series of semantic clusters that have remained constant, but the internal significance of which has changed according to changes in the economy, material culture, and in the social structure. The significance of this is more pronounced in Baranikov's 1937 uh, discussion of the figure of Krishna as presented in Lalu Lal's uh, Prem Sagar, the, the Ocean of Love, uh, published in 1810. And this text was particularly conducive to paleontological analysis because it's a retelling of the legend of Krishna that first appears in the Marabharata, um, which is compiled somewhere between the third century BCE and the third century CE, then elaborated in the 10th book of the Bhagavata Purana, uh, around 1000 CE, both of which were written in Sanskrit, but were then retold in a number of North Indian dialects before Lalo Lal rendered it in Sanskritized Hindi for a very different audience. Uh, in a lecture to the Academy of Sciences in 1935, Baranikov argues that Krishna is of folkloric origin and that the Bhagavata Purana, uh, in the Bhagavata uh, Purana, Brahmins had transformed the shepherd god into a shepherd god prince. So drawing on the vernacular rendering in the, of the legend in the 15th century, Lalu Lal stripped away the protracted dialogues and philosophical and religious themes found in the Puranas, placed uh, Krishna more firmly into a lower caste milieu, including considerably more detail about peasant life and festivities. Moreover, the two parts of the text relate to different textual layers, as he puts it, pertaining to different times and created by different castes. So the first part of Prem Sagar is a pastoral in which Krishna belongs to a very different social milieu than the higher alien, Aryan caste that created more traditional morals. Krishna is here a dark-skinned shepherd whose sympathy lies with shepherds and the lower castes in general. He's a rebel, a consistent advocate of the law of his caste, of the caste religion, and he wages a consistent struggle with the representation, representatives of traditional Brahminical pantheon. He defeats all the gods and proclaims the law of Vishnu. Krishna's is a radical natural religion, as he puts it. And this struggle with Shiva, uh, the cult of whom attracted mainly representatives of the so-called aristocratic castes, proves to be particularly fierce. The second part is a religious quasi-historical novel in which Krishna is now pure Shastriya, the, uh, the warrior caste, acting in union with Brahminism. And here he reaches a compromise with Shiva, declares that henceforth all members of the triad Brahma, Shiva and Vishnu are recognized as but three aspects of a single divine being, though Vishnu is regarded as the highest of the three. And this is a Brahminical reworking characteristic of the Puranas, um, the narrative of which in its original form was created by non-Brahmin castes. So Krishna's anti-Orthodox words and deeds in the pastoral part are now reconciled with orthodoxy by making them purely symbolic. Krishna the shepherd is now a divine being whose uh, deeds belong to the other world and in a mechanical fashion, he's made to recite entire hymns from the Vedas in defense of Brahminism. Now the contradiction within the text is particularly evident in Prem Sagar because although a Brahmin, Lalu Lal was not seeking to reaffirm traditional Brahminical privilege, but was working according to a more proto-nationalist agenda. The parallel traditions of scholastic Sanskrit and vernacular literature in verse characteristic of the era of Tulsidas had been irreversibly destroyed by the advent of British domination and the new Hindi literature arose along with new economic and political con conditions. Baranikov explains that Lalu Lal played a significant role in the formation of new Hindi prose, liberating it from archaic verse styles that were typical of European literature. 
Um, this tradition, this synthesis of the old literary tradition with new literary forms was completed only in the, the turn of the 20th century with the consolidation of the nationalist movement in the work of figures like the novelist Prem Chand, the first president of the anti-imperialist progressive writers movement, who sought to cleanse Hinsdi of Sanskritisms that distanced the literary from the popular language. But Prem Sagar remained a kind of transitional text, still containing Sanskritisms and incorporate, or incorporating a verse written in the Braj dialect, but nevertheless written in a simple, elegant prose uh, and is the work of uh, the first work of Hindi prose from which a literary tradition flows, as Branikov puts it. So the British promoted and published works in this language in order to further their own administrative goals. But this also served the interest of the Indian bourgeoisie that they had brought into being. They, and I quote, summoned the nascent bourgeois class to act, which continued to develop the prose language with great success. And a necessary, as a necessary weapon of the bourgeois press, literature, and so on. The entire further development of literary Hindi is closely connected with this development of the new bourgeoisie created by European capital. Now, between the time of Lalu Lal and Prem Chand was the 1850, 1857 Sepoy Mutiny and the final liquidation of the Mughal Empire, which led to a radical restructuring of the economy and social interaction. Persian lost its position as an important language of trade and, and the knowledge of English becomes a precondition of success in administrative and commercial life. There was now an, ambig an unambiguous fall of Sanskrit culture, as he puts it, and the simultaneous spread of Indi English language and capitalist culture as the in Indian intelligentsia in all provinces were first to forced to turn to the English language, even though it was viewed as an enemy that obstructs the working out of a common language of India. The penetration of Indi English into the Indian and into Ingl Indian vernacular languages was also strengthened with attempts to resist this through uh, Sanskrit or Arabic calques from, Eng from English uh, largely unsuccessful. And this was to be explained not by any recourse of related Indo-European languages, but because of the entry of the bearers of languages of corresponding languages into a single economic system. Now I'm going to finish off with, a, with a, just an evaluation of all this. Branikov died in 1952 and his reputation was seriously affected by uh, Stalin's attack on Marism in June 1950, after which a return to traditional forms of positivist scholarship was mandated, leading to a considerable nostalgia about pre-revolutionary uh, philology and oriental studies. After Indian independence, led by Brahminical forces who also adopted, who also dominated the Indian Communist Party, the formation of non-aligned movement after the 1955 Bandung Conference, Branikov's highlighting of caste dimensions of Indian culture was out of step with official Soviet cultural policy. Now, once again, Sanskrit literature, the bearer of Brahminical conception of society, was presented as the foundation of all Indian literary process that accompanied the formation of the Indian state. As with many intellectuals who maintained a su successful career in the Stalin period, Branikov's legacy needs serious reassessment. The destruction of the earlier form of budology in the purges was a significant loss that had the damaging effect on the field in general. And these were the, but these were the effects of various con conjunctural factors that shaped the field, uh, the recognition of which is important to enable us to be able to distinguish aspects of Stalin era Indology that had real and lasting value. Boranikov's application of the categories of early Soviet sociolinguistics to North Indian and uh, North Indian languages was undoubtedly a significant achievement. Not only was he able to correlate linguistic, social, and intellectual history, but also to highlight the ideological factors at work in the formation of standard languages and the disciplines with which they were connected. Another achievement was the consolidation and extension of the critique of, of European Indology and comparative philology in such a way that it was revealed as a collaborative enterprise between indigenous and colonial elites. 
It wasn't until the rise of Dalit studies in India in the 1990s that the dichotomy between uh, colonial and indigenous ideology and scholarship is overcome in any significant sense, even if there were incipient moments in that direction among the work of earlier Dalit intellectuals. Whatever the achievements of uh, post-colonial and subaltern studies in focusing attention on cultural effects of colonial domination, this trend remained unable to escape the pre-existing binaries, even while they were re-evaluated. Baranikov's work has, I think, an important role in, uh, to play in helping us to move that area of research forward. Similarly, the focus on the rise of vernacular Indian literature and its dynamic engagement with both the oral and folkloric traditions of the masses and with Brahminical tradition of literature in Sanskrit was a significant advance at that time. What is now called Hinduism is revealed to be sociologically and ideologically diverse sphere uh, within which social and ideological struggles took place before attempts to present a coherent doctrine uh, emerged with the rise of bourgeois intellectuals in the 19th century. Indian Marxist historians were able to develop that sphere further, as would the prominent historian of ancient India, Ramila Tapa. Uh, as such, Baranikov's work appears an important but neglected point of reference for Indian Marxists, I think. Uh, the anti-caste movement and of, in, of Oriental studies more generally, especially at a time when, the Indian, when Indian history is once again being distorted and mythologized, this time in the government's drive to create a discriminatory ethnocratic state based on Hindu chauvinism. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Greg. That is very neat and very precise. So, um, uh, so we'll um, maybe also listen to uh, Paramita, uh, you know, uh, 20 minutes again, and then take uh, the questions for both of you at the end. In the meantime, if, if uh, you know, uh, if there are any questions, you can, all, you can send it across on the chat to me and I can share it with the speakers as well as everybody else. So if you have any questions, please uh, put it uh, on the chat box. And even as the speakers is speaking, even that time, if you want to send something to me on the chat box you can you can do that any questions or comments on both the speakers so uh, over to you paramita i can't hear you yes thank thank yeah. you very much um, my paper uh, will be on farmers protest and uh, women's participation in mass mobilization in india so it's a very topical uh, paper and uh, since the protest is currently going on um, there could be questions, uh, you know, that we could later address, which I cannot put together in the paper right now. I, I, so I'd like to jump in straight away. Uh, since December 2019, India has seen continual demonstrations, agitations, blockades and conflict. Streets have been occupied by the protesting bodies and face violent state repression. Uh, the heavy-handed way in which the state responded to collective protest during the pandemic reveals the precarious nature of Indian democracy. Modi's government has curbed civil liberties, suspended the internet protest sites, clamped down on media coverage, arrested political opponents, students, dissidents, protesters, all in the name of restoring order and managing COVID-19 crisis. In spite of repression, the protests have continued, particularly the ongoing farmers' protest, which has the potential to seriously challenge deregulated capitalism and state oppression. Uh, the farmers have been uh, resisting implementation of three farm uh, bills that the government rushed through parliament in September 2020. They argued the new farm laws will give more freedom to the farmer, more autonomy as he or she will no longer depend on a middleman for selling and can send produce across state borders as well as to large agro businesses and grocery chains. Deregulation would open up agriculture to competition to foreign markets, boost farmer income, attract private investment, modernize the sector, improve infrastructure and go digital. Eliminating uh, the pu public regulatory system would make farming more profitable, opening up agriculture to the corporate world. The government employed the rhetoric of rights, saying that farmers will now be able to widen their networks, move freely and make alliances across artificial restrictive borders. However, farmers fear that since 85% of marginal farmers who have no access or minimum access to markets 
or transportation fa facilities, profit making through liberalization and deregulation would mainly favor big corporations. Deregulation favoring giant corporations would drive down prices, increasing uh, the possibility of exploitation and marginalization of small farmers, uh, creating havoc during times of oversupply as well as crop failure. So thousands of farmers, especially from the states of Punjab, Haryana and Western Uttar, pra Uttar Pradesh have started long marches to the capital and have been camping at three Delhi border points, Tikru, Singhu and Ghazipur since 26 November 2020 demanding an immediate repeal of the three controversial farm laws. They also demanded a legal guarantee on minimum uh, support prices for their crops. From November 2020 to January 2021, 11 rounds of talks have been held between the government and the farmers union. Uh, in the last round of talks that ended in January, the government offered to suspend the farm laws for one to 1.5 years. The Farmers Union will accept nothing short of complete repeal of these pro-corporate farm laws. And so currently the matter is in the Supreme Court, which has passed a stay order and uh, decided to set up a four-member committee to resolve the impasse. In my paper, uh, now I'm going to concentrate on the role of women uh, in mass mobilization uh, in terms of the farmers' protest. What, what really uh, can be read uh, when we're looking at this large-scale participation of women in the protest. So it's, it's very interesting. The farmers protest is very interesting because it is one of the biggest ongoing protests that we've seen in recent times being supported uh, by unions from various sectors, including service and manufacturing. We've seen a lot of state governments, anti, I mean, non-BJP state governments pro providing tacit support to the farmers. And it has seen overwhelming support from civil society and large scale participation of women across the caste, class, occupational, religious divide. It has brought the women of the anti-CA movement and women farmers together on the same platform, strengthening each other's fight and offering solidarity. So farmers' protest has brought to the fore a women, a women's role in mass mobilization. Uh, in January 2021, the Chief Justice of India asked lawyers to persuade women, children and the elderly to leave protest sites and go home, as it would be very difficult for them to brace the biting cold of winter and there may be considerable danger to their person if they continue to participate in such acts of resistance. The court patronizingly suggested that women's participation in the protest was limited to providing cooking and cleaning services, not seeing them as equal partners in the struggle and failed to recognize them as farmers in their own right. So the CGI's uh, remark drew large scale ire across protest lines as it was seen not just as an attempt to exclude women from the protest, but also as a warning of violence to come against the protesters. Women farmers rejected the court's appeal point blank and in fact it had the opposite effect by provoking more women to join the protests, asserting their identity as farmers and equal stakeholders. Uh, we will, and I'm, and I'm now quoting uh, a farmer, a woman farmer who says, we will either die and go back or win and go back. Something snapped within us when we heard the government tell the women to go back home. Says Jasbir Kaur, a farmer who has been camping at the Ghazipur protest site for over three months. She says, why should we go back? This is not just the men's protest. We toil in the fields alongside the men. Who are we if not farmers? Uh, the protest has drawn women of all ages and diverse backgrounds from across India. So uh, the protesters through their overwhelming and active participation have also successfully challenged the traditionally accepted gender roles of simply being caregivers and housewives who help the family in farming. They have also been able to resist gender discrimination through an assertion of identity as farmers and protesters in public space. Changing mindsets in states where femicide, sexual violence and gender discrimination are rampant has been a persistent challenge for activists. These sites have then also become important venues for discussion and debate on gender equality. Men and women have, uh, ha have had to occupy spaces in close proximity and a deeper understanding of gender imbalance is beginning to emerge among both men and women who have been sharing these spaces for the last several months. Uh, activists hold frequent discussions on women's work and their contribution to the rural economy. Regular announcements from the stage about treating women as equals echo around the protest sites throughout the day. Um, and I, a, a young IT engineer, female uh, IT engineer, who left her job in Dubai to join, join and volunteer at the protest site, says, I like this India. Gender rights activists have been working with women and men at these sites and have been able to normalize conversations around taboo topics, such as menstruation. At the Ghazipur site, 29-year-old law student from Bangalore 
have set up a mobile sanitary napkin store where the products are displayed openly. And she says, the men got used to it soon enough. Now these conversations are normal around here. Men don't flinch when they say sanitary napkins anymore. The activists have been helping mobilize women and organize for January 18th to be recognized as Women Farmers Day. Women work equally in the fields with men. It's only right they should be here to protest. The awareness among women about their own power has never been higher than now, they say. Whether such sentiments will spread beyond the protest is unclear, but for now, female farmers are being seen, heard, acknowledged, offering a new version, vision of what gender equality might look for the country. And I quote, uh, we, have, we have looked upon them as mothers, sisters, wives, says a young male farmer from Punjab. But now we see them in a different light. What is most important is women have begun to see themselves in a, uh, themselves differently. There is a rising consciousness among women protesters who now understand their oppression and exploitation and know that they have to stand up and fight. Their self-awareness has emboldened them. On March 8th, uh, 2021, wearing bright yellow scarves representing the color of mustard fields, the women took center stage at one key site, uh, chanting slogans, holding small marches and making speeches against the laws. They were joined by thousands of women from all walks of life. There were speeches, plays, songs, dance, poetry, readings that highlighted women's contribution to farming among others. The stage was managed by women, the speakers were all women and issues tackled were about farming in general and women farmers in particular and the contribution of women farmers in this movement. So women's large scale participation marking March 8th at the protest site is cause for celebration as it has been one of the largest gathering of women protesting against privatization, corporatization and neoliberalism in the world. What is extremely significant about this protest is the emergence of a new crop of feminist activists who co-organized and coordinated the protests that brought both men and women together. These new women activists demonstrated a high level of political consciousness by recognizing the common struggles of both factory or industrial workers and farmers. Nordeep Kaur, who has been organizing male and female industrial workers to demand better working conditions and assumed a leadership role in this organization, led a rally of thousands of industrial workers in support of the farmers movement. 22-year-old environmental and gender activist uh, Disha Ravi was arrested by the Delhi police on allegations uh, that she was providing a toolkit to DFM India. Um, also, you know, is evidence of a case where women uh, have come out um, in the open to argue against the government's neoliberal offensives uh, and successfully make links with larger social, uh, environmental and political struggles that define our century. So the massive participation of women in the protest has garnered worldwide attention. The protest has attracted uh, the attention of activists, politicians, and celebrities around the world. Prominent among them is Greta Thunberg, who extend, they've all extended their support to the movement. So the prominent presence of women is what is perhaps uh, the world's largest ongoing, in what is perhaps the world's largest ongoing protest movement, and certainly the biggest domestic challenge facing the prime minister's government, has put a spotlight on the important role women play in agriculture in India. It also marks a milestone in women's struggle for equality and their leadership in resistance movements. Most of the protesting farmers uh, come from the three uh, North Indian states of Haryana, Uttar Pradesh and Punjab, states which have the worst male to female ratio, highest record of violent crimes against women, rampant practice of dowry and marriage, lowest property and land ownership among women in the country. So the large the presence of protesting women from these states is thus extremely significant and quite remarkable. Women who are protesting against the farm laws worry that these laws will not only threaten their livelihood, but may also drive their male relatives to desperate measures such as suicide and abandonment. Every day, at least 28 uh, people depending, dependent on farming die by suicide, mostly brought on by their inability to repay you know, loans from private money lenders and banks. The statistics on farmers' suicide reveal the extent of catastrophe and indicate that it is mostly men who take their lives, leaving the women and children uh, in abject poverty. So widows of farmers or agricultural laborers have had to bear the excruciating burden of childcare and work to provide for food, education and shelter for the family. It is no wonder that women are fiercely contesting the laws that they believe will exacerbate poverty, exploitation and financial hardship. So the farmers protest has rekindled women's demand, also rekindled women's demand for land reforms. Although female, female farmers represent 
uh, 75% of the female working class in rural uh, areas of India, they own barely 13% of farmland. According to the India Human Development Survey, 83% of agricultural land is inherited by male members of the family and uh, less than 2% by females. According to an Oxfam India report, more, um, more than 85% of rural women in India engage in agriculture, but only 13% of women own land. The odds are particularly stacked against single women farmers as they juggle home and work, land and law. If the new laws are passed, the market for agricultural produce is bound to become more distant and hence more competitive and exploitative. So women are keenly aware of uh, how their presence at the protest site offers some level of protection to the men from police brutality and tough action by security forces. They're also conscious of their own contribution to the cause of resistance as they maintain a steady supply of rations and daily necessities at the campsites. Many women farmers participate in the protest by rotation as female family and community members take turn to look after children and tend to the farms back home. This has strengthened affective networks and consolidated the fight against uh, state-sponsored capitalist takeover of their lands and labor. Women protesters are now a formidable, uh, you know, formidable group forging alliances uh, with the wider struggles of the working class movement. The predominantly non-violent nature uh, of the protests have also encouraged large-scale participation of um, you know, women and elderly and the visible presence of women farmers at the campsites have inspired other oppressed groups in society, uh, particularly minority women and students, both urban and rural, to come out openly uh, in support of the protesters and combine forces to fight uh, government's anti-people, anti-farmer uh, measures. Uh, the collective struggle against the encroachment um, of corporate capital has weakened gender, caste and communal divisions. Although there are divisions uh, between small and medium farmers, the encroachment of corporate capitalism represents a danger to both. And on this basis, women have taken a prominent role in organizing resistance, even among those communities that are traditional and male dominated. Uh, the farmers' protest has brought to the fore women's role in mass mobilization and has tremendous significance for women's movement for justice, equality, and rights. Their participation represents a crucial dimension in resisting the return of the strong state. The farmers protest needs to make links with larger urban struggles and the workers movement in order to move beyond its current impasse. So I want to conclude by saying that the, the protests have highlighted the role women play in farming, as well as reveal their skills in organizing and mobilizing. The presence of women in the protest also challenges the stereotype that Indian women are, you know, uh, are, are passive victims of social injustices and violence. Women have seized the opportunity uh, presented by the protest to demand not just the repeal of the controversial farm laws, but also to end discrimination and inequality. It is yet to be seen what comes of this massive protest that has shook the very foundations of the country and brought ordinary people from all walks of life to lend support to the cause of the farmers. One takes hope from the fact that the movement and mass mobilization of both men and women seems to be going from strength to strength and there are no signs of anyone involved giving up. Thank you. Thank you, Baromita. It is um, good to hear about the farmers movement, uh, which has uh, always been so inspiring since at least one year. And uh, I think when we, you presented specifically on the women's uh, participation, um, but uh, as you would agree, uh, if you see it slightly, you know, in the wider political, um, you know, in terms of the political scenario in India, then, and when we talk about how does one fight uh, right-wing populism, authoritarianism, and maybe this historical materialism conference across different sessions, if maybe there is this question, which might be there in everyone's mind, you know, when we come to a Marxist conference, today's key question also for a lot of us is how do we fight right-wing populism, authoritarianism, which is kind of a world over phenomenon. Um, and there the farmers movement in the Indian context has been such a movement which the right-wing is not able to appropriate in any way a most solid challenge to the hegemony of 
the ruling party in India has come from the farmers movement. I mean, it's not like there have not been movements before. We know of the Scheinbach protests that happened before. Just like yeah, the effects of the Scheinbach protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act, those effects are still lingering. You know, a lot of our friends are in jail. Uh, the UAPA, the draconian extraordinary laws were invoked, anti-terror laws against uh, protesters. But, um, and yet the farmers movement has been such that the state here tried even invoking these draconian extraordinary laws against the protesters, as you know, early on they tried that. Uh, they tried, uh, you know, calling them Khalistani, anti-national, everything in their card, in the kitty box of the home minister. They tried everything <laughs> and nothing really works. You know, uh, we talk about fascism in power or fascism out of power. But here is like an opposition, which is not in power. Maybe it won't even contest in elections. Maybe it will never come to power. And yet, as sheer opposition, this has been so effective um, against this present regime because there's also this very, very clever, you know, very, very shrewd uh, character of this regime, you know, that any kind of opposition seems to kind of fizzle out. And that's where the farmers' movement has been absolutely brilliant. And, uh, and there, when in that context, when you uh, bring women there, you know, it adds to the thing. So um, um, I was seeing if there are other questions. Uh, I don't see other questions yet that have come to me. So I would like to engage with you, Paramita, if you don't mind, as the chair. Uh, I'm taking my, I'm, maybe I'm <laughs> abusing my privilege here as the chair. Uh, so, uh, so how do you look at the, uh, you know, in the farmers movement, you talked about um, uh, women, but if we were to uh, break down this women category, you know, uh, and look at what kind of women are these, uh, what section of women are these, the other presenter, he was talking about caste and anti-caste, so in terms of also the caste background, what kind of women are um, uh, participating and for that matter even men because there has been a you referred to Navdeep Kaur uh, you know which is excellent right um, uh, now Navdeep Kaur um, uh, comes from a Dalit background right um, so she totally stands out but in terms of the wider women that are there you know um, and not just on caste, I'm saying like in terms of, a, you know, the kind of social background and all that, because uh, the presence of tractors, the presence of farmers, generally the outer image, at least of the farmers movement, the kind of uh, the images that get disseminated are mostly of the men folk, you know, in their big tractors and all. So if the women are coming, are the women coming who uh, tag along with the men? Uh, they are people from the family, a lot of family, because it's also a familial thing. The entire community has been mobilized, as you know, you know, for the farmers movement. So I was wondering if you want to maybe for the uh, viewers, for the listeners, it will be nice if you can tell us a bit more, uh, you know, about uh, what kind of women are these that we are talking about. I think largely what we see in the media uh, would be, you know, women farmers protesting. Mm -hmm. So with their, uh, and mostly from Punjab and Haryana. So you see a certain kind of women in terms of their social background that you see in the media protesting. Uh, also what you see, and this is, this is what I'm talking about in terms of the visibility. What you, what you really see when you are looking at um, media, media representation not what actually is, uh, is, is happening on the ground. So largely what you see is uh, women farmers who not are just, who, they're not simply tagging along. They come, they, they, there have been recent media reports where you've seen images of women uh, farmers uh, driving tra tractors. And uh, these are largely what you see is women farmers from Punjab, Haryana, 
uh, Punjabi women uh, farmers coming to the protest sites, but you also have a lot of reporting on um, a sort of pan-India appeal when it comes to, uh, you know, the protests uh, and the composition of women in these protest sites. So you have very young people protesting. A lot of them are Punjabis. For instance, the uh, woman I talked about, the IT engineer who left her job in Dubai and came to join as a volunteer, worked as a volunteer. She's a Punjabi woman uh, who has left her uh, job in Dubai to join the protest. Then there is a law student from Bangalore, who's also a Punjabi woman, very young law student who's come to uh, volunteer at the site as well as um, join the protest. So what you see is large scale participation from these three North Indian states, but you also see participation in terms of demographic. You see a participation uh, of you know young as well as old. So from a septuagenarian, uh, to say a uh, 18 year old, you know, there are two 18 year old farmers who've been in the limelight who've come from Chhattisgarh, Central India. Then there have been Dalit farmers who have come from Kerala to the protest site. There have been activists who come from all over the country. So I suppose, although there is a large scale participation of women farmers from Punjab, Haryana, and Uttar Pradesh, you also have significant participation of non-farm non-farmers women who are not farmers women who are you know uh, involved in other uh, activities women who social class um, there is a varied uh, composition when it comes to social classes so all all kinds of women from different strata of society are also interested have shown their interest have engaged with this movement and have actually come on the protest sites so on 8th march 2021 there was massive participation from all from from almost you know all states of india to the protest sites celebrating women's day and there was large scale participation of artists activists uh, young students other women anti ca women shahin bagh women came and uh, joined the farmers uh, who were sitting at the uh, protest sites so i think it has been it has been a movement that has mobilized women across the country, mobilized women from uh, different uh, social classes, uh, religious backgrounds. So it's crossed those you know, divisions uh, that we uh, see exist in our society and uh, the divisions which have been artificially you know, erected to make, um, you know, to, 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 to weaken weaken solidarity and and uh, struggles you know common struggles so i i think it's very inspiring because we've seen large scale participation from all kinds of women okay we have got another uh, question here paramita for you i'll just read it out the farmers movement is a really exciting example of social movement unionism social movement unionism that's a term what has been the trade union role in this has it changed the bureaucracies? I guess the, the person means trade union bureaucracy. Yeah. Has it changed the trade union, the bureaucracy's approach to gender politics? So that's a question about trade unions. What are they doing with regard so to- The farmers movement, as the question says, is really exciting. I agree with it being really exciting social uh, movement. Trade unions have been uh, at the forefront of this movement. So the farmers union have been uh, the leading, you know, uh, organizers of uh, the protest. So uh, the role of trade unions have been really important in this movement. And there have been trade unions, not just uh, the ones who represent the farmer, not just the Kisan uh, trade unions, but other trade unions have also joined in and have um, have lent uh, support. Now, if uh, we're talking about uh, the trade unions, uh, trade unions breaking gender, um, you know, uh, uh, reassessing their approach to gender politics, um, I am sure um, the women's role and the kind of uh, presence that women have, uh, have have shown in this movement must have uh, effected um, changes in uh, the way trade union bureaucracy works, but it is too early. And I, I really wouldn't be able to answer this question with deep insight because I don't really know how, um, how the changes have happened or what kind of changes or to what extent uh, trade union bureaucracies have changed uh, their approach to gender politics, but um, considering the kind of leading roles and leadership roles that women have taken uh, up 
but vis-a-vis -vis this movement, Navid Kaur, for instance, I mean, she's a she's an activist, and uh, she mobilized a whole lot of um, unions um, to you know join the protest. So I am sure there will be, if not a huge change, if not a significant or radical change, a slow, gradual change to the way trade union bureaucracies work when it comes to gender politics. But yeah, as I said, I I wouldn't be able to uh, you know I wouldn't be able to provide any deep insight into that. Okay, so there is, how do the speakers, this is I think Paul's question. How do the speakers, okay. Okay, uh, let me also add this before we come to Paul's question here on the trade union thing and also because you refer to the workers thing Navdeep Kaur and all because they're also working uh, they're also organizing workers the thing is that one of the key sites of the uh, of the um, of the farmers protest you see basically there are uh, these three four border points you know like entry to Delhi where the farmers movement are actually put up their barricades uh and uh um you know and and that's where they are that's their base area you know they operate out of that since like almost uh an year they are blockaded those entry points to delhi now one of the entry points uh which is called singu that is a working class area called kundli that's the name of a place and kundli is an industrial area what kind of industry, what kind of factories do you have there? There you have uh, like a highly corrosive kind of exploitation there. You know, like say you have other areas which is like around Delhi uh, where you have more formal, uh, formal industries like big car industry and all. But in Kundli, those are smaller units and workers oppression exploitation is really high. So the workers are like not really the modern whatever precariat, but slightly traditional industries, but really high exploitation, you know, and the use of labor contractors and all. So you have this entire class of workers living, uh, was staying around that area where the farmers protest is happening, you see. So that's a very interesting convergence there. And that's not with the other border points where the blockade by the farmers are there. I'm talking about just the single one because of which a lot of people are working organizing the farmers movement there and also doing the organizing of these workers there and that's where the convergence is really coming between a class-based politics organizing workers and the farmers because one thing we have to keep in mind um, is that the farmers a lot of them are very rich farmers you know if you go to the site they have put like you know they have come with the tractors but they are pretty well endowed farmers so they have converted that into nice rooms with air conditioning and 24 7 uh, oh, internet like high speed internet yeah, yeah they're, they're pretty well well they have a lot of money man you know and the kind of food and all that they are eating there they're they're very well endowed but these these workers there they're really poor and they're really oppressed so people are like being part of the farmers movement but also organizing this now when this convergence happened the police, the state didn't like it. And that's where people like Navdeep Kaur, as Paramita would know, was arrested. Yes. There's a lot of police repression. So farmers movement is kind of tolerated, you can say. Uh, even if the ruling government doesn't want, they have to, they're forced to tolerate it. But the moment you try to create any convergence with the workers there in that area, then there's tremendous state repression. But right? interestingly, sir, yeah. Rajiv, um, I think the farmers' movement can come out of its current impasse and strengthen and get and exactly. becomes you know stronger if there are alliances across you know uh, these classes. So working classes have to come together and and join the farmers' movement for it to you know become a solid uh, movement against state regulated deregulated capitalism and oppression. I think, that's right. That's I think those right. That's convergences right. are really interesting, and those convergences are po points of strength. They should be made, you know. Uh, they sh they should turn into uh, really strong alliances, so that 
That's right. So the, the farmers movement does not just stand out alone as one single group. It becomes part of a working class movement. That's right. That's right. okay. There's a question from Batini Rao. Uh, Batini Rao, uh, there's a question. The question is. How do the speakers reflect on the balance of class critique and identity politics in their thinking? Looks like it's a question for both of you. So balance between class critique and identity politics. That's the question. Maybe Craig can take it first. Yeah, I'll, I'll, take it, I'll take it first in terms of the historical dimension of the analysis between caste and, uh, and so on. Um, I think one of the problems is that uh, Indian Marxists were too often treated caste simply as a matter of identity politics or simply as a, as a, as a cultural phenomenon, as a superstructural cultural phenomenon that was some kind of heritage from the pre-capitalist feudal past. Um, and rather than uh, and identifying it as something that had persisting forms of economic underpinnings, um, in, in the same way, of course, as, as race does say in the United States. Um, and uh, of course, because the division of labor and so on is, um, is built into that. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, I think uh, that say someone like Baranikov argues is, the, is a way to kind of move behind, move beyond that kind of binary. Um, and the way that he really approaches questions of caste and its relationship to uh, culture is more like the way that Gramsci treats the question of the relationship between uh, the national language and social dialects, the relationship between um, spontaneous grammars and the, uh, the, the, the grammars of uh, uh, the, the Communist Party would able to bring about a, a written uh, a written grammar that would give uh, the intellectual movement of a revolutionary uh, class uh, coherence and systematicity. Um, and so uh, when he's actually looking then at uh, the questions of the relationship between Sanskrit and the different emerging national languages of, of India and so on, he's, he's doing that uh, very much in this kind of way rather than in a way that's focused on questions of identity first and foremost. Um, and so while of course um, the, the whole question of identity politics is, is an important one, uh, in, in order not to uh, draw up some kind of uh, dichotomy then between those uh, uh, cult cultural factors and uh, economically undergirded uh, factors. Uh, we need to see them as integrated at a molecular level, as it were, rather than simply one is uh, uh, is a question of culture, the other is a question of economics. And 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 that dynamic is something, of course, that uh, that Marxist theory has had to deal with, and uh, in a number of different ways. But it takes a particular form in India, of course. And the question of caste being one thing that gives it a very specific form in India. And, uh, and my point was simply that uh, we, we see in the 1930s the beginnings of uh, a, a way of thinking beyond those dichotomies that I think was uh, was helpful. So, uh, okay, I think we have a uh, we have a question here, uh, Craig. There's a question for you by Aritro Bhattacharji. Uh, was there any interaction between Rahul Sankritayan and uh, Kosambi and Soviet Indologists? Uh, did Indologists engage with the work of Kabir, Tukaram and other figures opposed to Brahmanism? Yes, well, Baranikov did, um, although it wasn't the focus of his work, but clearly he was, he was looking there at the way in which um, uh, these kind of folk narratives were then canonized and ideologized according to a Brahminical agenda. And uh, he, he writes uh, a number of things about uh, Kabir Tukaram and so on. Um, but um, his, his focus is more, the, the two big works that he wrote was one, on, uh, on Tulsidas, which were, were included the actual translation of the uh, Ramcharit Manas and uh, Prem Sagar and, and so on. So he, he, wrote, he wrote a lot about these and they kind of figured into his, um, 
history of uh, Indian literature as part of the history of the uh, socio-political struggles of the time. Now, as for the relationship between Raul Sankritiyo and Kasambi, this is Darman and Kasambi who visited, uh, who visited India in the 20s and 30s. Yes, um, uh, certainly there are important interactions there. Uh, Sankritiyo originally went to the Soviet Union in order to be able to meet with Fyodor Shobatskoy um, and uh, ended up teaching for some time, as did uh, Darman and Kasambi at the short-lived Indi uh, Institute of Buddhist Culture in, uh, in Leningrad. Um, he, uh, uh, Kasambi visited twice. Uh, Kasambi's response to that time is quite interesting because uh, on the one hand, he was in, uh, enthused by the, um, the, the, the secularizing agenda and so on that had taken place uh, in India, but of course, whether uh, in, in, in the Soviet Union, but by the time they got there, it was the time of the repression of the Buddhist communities uh, in the 19, uh, at the end of the 1920s and beginning of 1930s. And so he, he was obviously very disturbed by that. And uh, so what we see in Dharman and Kasambi's work is a kind of rather ambivalent relationship to the Soviet Union of uh, early Stalin period uh, uh, and uh, his, his own ideas about the potentials of um, using Buddhism as a, uh, as a means to develop a specifically Indian form of, of, of Marxist thinking. Um, so, so that's all very interesting in, 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 its, own, in its own right. Raul Sankritiyan um, went to India and uh, went to uh, the Soviet Union a number of times. Uh, he actually married one of uh, Shobatskoy's students, a Tibetologist, uh, and they had a son. The son then lived in uh, Leningrad all his life. Uh, he, wor uh, he worked at the National Library, uh, what's now called the National Library in St. Petersburg, what was then called the Publicznaya Biblioteka. Uh, in St. Petersburg in the uh, um, Eastern Manuscripts uh, Department. Um, and uh, Sankritjayan actually uh, returned to India and was then expelled from the Communist Party initially because of his uh, support for Hindi. Uh, now, where, whether that was some uh, extrapolation that he'd drawn from the development of uh, Stalinist Marxism, I'm not sure, but certainly he never really came to that kind of critical awareness of the uh, limitations of Stalinism. And certainly not, he didn't really speak about this uh, openly, to my knowledge, um, uh, about how that was even affecting the struggle uh, in India because of the way, of course, the, uh, uh, the Russian party had, uh, had hegemony by that time, very, very strong hegemony in the common term. Um, so he was he, he was much more uh, close to the, um, the the Stalinist line, I think, than was uh, was Kasambi. And Kasambi, of course, then uh, ended up being a very important influence on um, on Ambedkar in the in the nineteen uh, in the nineteen fifties uh, and nineteen sixties. So uh, and and you said at the beginning about the the, the very early ver uh, writings about Marxism in India. Um, there is something of a debate as to whether it was uh, Tilak or, or Kasambi that first published uh, works by, um, uh, by, by Marx and, uh, and uh, reflections on Marx uh, in, in Marathi at that time. So that, that there seems to be now some discussion about who was first there. So, so yes, they did have some important uh, connections. I still have some, uh, some archival work to do on this. Um, but of course, the, uh, the the pandemic has somewhat got in the way of going to work in Soviet archives in the last couple of years. He's muted. You're muted. Saraj, you're muted. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, I have something to ask you, Craig, but before that, there was one additional section to the question by Oritro, which is if the Indologist engaged with the works of Kabir, Tukaram and other such figures. Do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, yes, I, I did mention that, that it's, uh, it's certainly in um, Baranikov's work on modern English, Indian literature. He does, he does discuss it. Um, and uh, he, he regards it as very important and... Uh, uh, he, uh, but the thing is that his his two major works were on um, 
uh, Tulsidas, and uh, when when he writes about Tulsidas, then he sets Tulsidas within the context of larger anti-caste um, movements within literature. So, so yes, uh, he he was probably the first person to write with any kind of degree of systematicity in Russian about these figures, bringing them to public awareness. But uh, but as I say, in the 1950s, then. Uh, the focus on these caste uh, dimensions of Indian culture uh, became less popular because, of course, they wanted to, uh, the, the Indian, uh, the, the Soviet state wanted to make uh, common cause and, and uh, with uh, Nehru's India and, uh, and so on. So, so that kind of fell out of, uh, fell out of prominence. But um, so, uh, yes, it appears uh, within, these, within these works. And, but it's, it's kind of a more important part of the work of Baranikov than it became subsequently in the works of, of, of later Soviet Indologists. Craig, I was wondering in Baranikov's work, if he was looking at Tulsidas's um, uh, Ramcharit Manas, right? Uh, as anti-caste, uh, on what grounds uh, was he saying that? Because that doesn't seem so obvious, you know. <laughs> well, he wasn't saying it was an anti-caste work. What he what he was saying was that it's kind of caught between the um, ven uh, vernacular and, and, and anti-caste movement that's taken place at the time. It's caught between those kind of ven vernacular forms of, of literature and the the uh, Brahminical works that were largely in Sanskrit. But what he argues is that um, he uh, that Tulsidas moves beyond the kind of self enclosure in the uh, within Sanskrit culture of Brahminical texts, okay. and, is, and is able to become a kind of uh, proto nationalist figure. In that, what he's doing is kind of trying to unite the perspectives of. Uh, the different castes within one work rather than excluding them and providing just a uh, Brahminical perspective. And what he argues, and this is something that's very much comes from this, from, from the Stalinist Marxism of the time, and I think is one of his limitations, is that it kind of um, anticipates the agenda of socialist realism and its nationalist uh, and the fact that the that the that the national that the brahminical elite would lead a uh, national liberation movement so he's kind yeah. of uh, and the thing is he publishes this work in 1948 so immediately after indian independence and immediately after the war when uh, when, when they're looking for that so so no he's not presenting it as a um, uh, as an anti-caste work, but he's saying that anti-caste perspectives are incorporated into the work, as in a novel, for example, mm. gives voice to them, and they become part of the kind of national culture. As a result, yeah, of culture, yeah, it's like more like a national culture, yeah. So that's yeah. why he thought. That's why he actually valued those works more than the works of Tukaram uh, and uh, and Kabir, because he thought that they were much more narrowly focused in in a caste agenda. So he thought this was more universal and more, uh, more, more of a kind of proto-nationalist agenda. It had that kind of sense of uh, focusing on the people, what in Russia is called narodnost, which was part of uh, uh, the, the, the whole idea of, uh, of um, socialist realism. And that's, I think, one of his limitations. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And a kind of limitation which, um, kind of limitation which he shares with uh, so many other leading left-wing and Marxist scholars in India, you know. I mean, till just 10 years back, 20 years back, uh, you know, people were still reading it like that. Now with the rise of a powerful Dalit movement, as you know, and the caste critique, uh, you know, people have kind of uh, realized the follies uh, that they have done. So that is, but otherwise, uh, in terms of Baranikov's uh, rest of his scholarly work, um, you know, in Buddhism, the, like has he actually engaged with uh, any particular Buddhist texts or something, in or did he read Pali or something? Right in the night. Well, he, uh, he he studied that ancient Indian culture and so on with uh, uh, Shobatskoy and so on earlier. Um, what happened was though, when the Buddhist the, uh, the the Buddhist movement in Siberia was repressed. 
and a lot of the um, Buddhist, uh, the Buddhologists um, uh, were re were repressed in the in the purges in the 1930s. And uh, what happened was that Baranikov then focused on the uh, well, the medieval period, the early modern period of, of Indian literature, and left his work on Buddhism to the side. And he wrote a little bit about Buddhism in the 1920s, but the but the important point was that it. Um, uh, it was kind of dangerous to write in the 1930s uh, in celebration or, or, or to find uh, aspects that were positive in Buddhism because uh, the Buddhist community in, in the Soviet Union was very, facing very serious repression uh, in, in Siberia in the, in, in the 1930s. Uh, and, and I think that's where the problem lies because I think that had he been able to make the connections between um, the Buddhist critique of Brahminism and then the modern critique of Brahminism, um, then it would have been um, he would, then the potential of the work that he was doing would have would have come to the fore. But uh, this is one of the limitations of working within that Stalinist environment that it allows you. Uh, well, because it wasn't directly related to political questions, it gave you a certain amount of autonomy to be able to develop critically those perspectives. But then later it kind of becomes enclosed and limited by it. And so what, what I'm saying is that it's worth another look, because I think there are things in there that we can now liberate from the narrowness of those Stalinist, uh, those Stalinist perspectives. OK, there is uh, one more question here. Um, uh... Again, directed to you, Craig, uh, which is, uh, did Baranikov visit India and uh, did he, was he aware of the work of Anabhav Sathe? Did he analyze the work of Dalit cultural activists like Anabhav Sathe? And then there's one more question. And after this, I'll, I'll read out the other question from Pritam Singh. Yeah. Um, no, he never went to India. Uh, he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't able to in Stalin's time. And in fact, in the purges, the reason why most of uh, many of the Indologists were actually repressed was not because of their works, the specific ideas that they put forward in Indology. And this, and this, was, this was quite common as far as the purges were concerned. Um, but they were open to being accused of being involved in espionage of one form or another because they had spent considerable times abroad. And this was quite common. So um, people who had, who'd say gone into gone to Japan and studied in Japan, then in the 1930s, they, uh, they were open to being accused by somebody of having all of these foreign contacts because in the Soviet Union of Stalin's time, of course, there was absolute paranoia about um, being infiltrated by foreign spies and, uh, and all of this. And that was really what drove the purges in many respects, and especially why so many Orientalists were caught up in the purges, but not necessarily because of the ideas they put forward, was because they were open to being accused of that. And Baranikov kind of survived because he never went to India. He always wanted to go to India, he was never able to. Um, and so his... Um, um, his knowledge of the kind of Indian struggles on the ground was necessarily limited as a, as a, as a result of that. Um, and it's worth just thinking about that for the purges as well, because generally when we talk about this, we have a tendency to think that, I mean, apart from in the areas of direct political economic discourse, in more cultural discourses, they were more the results of institutional politics. The, people who were caught up in this because you can find the situations in which uh, on the side of an ideological battle more or less the same number of people were were purged and that's that's because it was about people who then um condemned other people or, or, or gave away information about other people to try and defend themselves and it developed a logic of its own so um this is uh, this is one of the things that lies behind it this is one of those Con conjunctural factors that if we want to understand something like Indology in the Soviet Union, we have to understand there are all sorts of different pressures working at, according to different temporalities at different times. And that's one of the things that makes it difficult. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things that we can do now that probably wasn't possible in the, in, in the past. So what about Anabhav Sate? Did he meet him or something? Did he, was he aware? Because Anabhav Sate did visit the Soviet Union, right? 
Well, many people, uh, well, I don't, and I have no knowledge of him uh, having met him. Uh, of course, a lot of people visited the Soviet Union. Um, uh, Periyar visited the Soviet Union in the 1930s, uh, about which it would be very interesting to publish those, those accounts. Tagore went to um, the Soviet Union. Tagore, of course. <laughs> um, and, and of course, these. He was a, he, he was he a celebrity met, at the time, Tagore, you know, so of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah he probably met Tagore because Tagore went to, went to Leningrad uh, and, and so on. So, um, but as far as I know, that figure not. Mm hmm. So, okay, so we have a question from uh, Pritam Singh uh, regarding the neglect of caste in a mechanistic Soviet Stalinist historical materialism. Would you be able to throw some light whether the Brahminical domination in Indian communist parties might be also responsible for that neglect? I so think, not just Stalinism, but also the Brahminical domination within India, within the communist parties. Well, I think, it, I think it's certainly one of the factors. Um, and uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, of course, to some extent, it was natural that would be the case because they were the most educated part of society and, and, and so on. But, uh, but, but certainly um, uh, then... The, the fact that the, uh, the, there was a Brahminical domination of the Communist Party in India was also one of the reasons why in the Soviet Union there was no real engagement with the ideas of the anti-caste movement. They were simply uh, treated as being kind of sectarian splitters or, you know, it followed the, 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 the vagaries, the zigzags of the Comintern at that time, which moved from, you know, on the one hand, extreme sectarianism, then to a popular front line. And when it became a popular front line, what they wanted to do was to make common cause with uh, progressive nationalism. And of course, progressive nationalism was Brahminically dominated um, right from the very beginning. And then, and then of course, the um, the, the, the Soviet, uh, the, the Communist Party itself was uh, was dominated by Brahmins. But of course, now one of the things we learn is that there were Dalits operating within the Communist Party who were trying to put forward uh, their, their own agenda. A recent uh, very interesting um, uh, memoir uh, by a guy called, his name something more, uh, who was a, a, a friend of uh, Ambedkar's, um, who remained in the Communist Party and fought to try to bring about more attention or a more flexible and critical attitude towards the question of caste. Uh, we now start to learn about these things being, being published. And I think one of the things that we start to see is that there were potentials there that were not uh, realized, partly because of this A, Brahminical domination of the Communist Party and B, because of the Stalinism that, uh, that, that dominated, uh, that, that came from Moscow. You're muted. Uh, okay. So, um, um, so I think we are at the end of the session. Thank you so much, uh, Paramita. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, and Craig, very nice, very deep questions, so much to explore in the limited time. And I think we got some interesting questions also here. So thank you very much, both of you. And thank you, uh, the listeners whom I couldn't see. It was behind some <laughs> curtain. Uh, so thank you very much uh, and all the best, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.